So, um, I just want to show of hands. I can see. I, I don't need the house lights up. I can. I think I can see you. Who's um, who's played Pokemon Go? <laughs> Incredible. Um, yeah. So. Half a billion people have downloaded Pokemon Go since it was launched. That's, that's incredible, isn't it? You know, just uh, um, you know, just that short time, it's just taken over the world. Who knows whether it's going to be here tomorrow? Uh, but um, you know, it just shows what um, augmented reality can do. I think it's something that we've been uh, talking about for many years that, that that was going to be possible. But this is actually, I think, the first tangible example of where where it's where it's worked really well. The sort of interface between. Uh, the digital and the real worlds. But, um, you know, my question is for, for today's panel is, is that the best that we can expect? And are, are there any um, cases, that, use cases that we have for, for travel and tourism? And, I, and I'm hoping that uh, they're going to say that we can. Um, so I just wanted to uh, show you uh, a little video as well. If you don't know what augmented reality is, this, this may be uh, the vision of an augmented reality future. Fantastic. Si quieres una buena calificación. Voy lo más rápido que puedo. Has pensado en correr. Es saludable y eficiente. Seguro que no hay más trabajos disponibles. Yo estudié para ser profesora y estoy haciendo mercados. Y además puedes quedarte con los puntos de fidelización. Eres una monte afortunada. Tienes que confiar en la aplicación. Te sientes inspirada. Gracias. Chao. ¿Quién soy yo? No es lo que quiero decir. ¿Para dónde voy? No. Puedo volver a empezar. Olvídalo. Estoy presente ahora. Me amo. Estoy libre de mi ira. Estoy libre de mi tristeza. Y el amor es mi tristeza. Habla español. Adiós. hacer por usted? ¿Qué está pasando? Mis puntos están bien. No se preocupe, sus puntos están seguros conmigo. ¿Le puedo ayudar en algo más, Emilio? Yo no soy Emilio, yo soy Juliana Restrepo. Por favor, espero. Hola, Juliana Restrepo. Me alegra verte. ¿Qué puedo hacer por ti? Mis puntos están bien. ¿Qué está pasando? Tranquila, todo está bien. Parece que alguien está intentando vulnerar su cuenta. 
por favor. So um, that probably looks like um, an episode of uh, Black Mirror. I don't know if you've uh, been watching that on Netflix uh, recently, but um, uh, that's possibly the dystopian future of uh, augmented reality. I think it shows, shows some of the uh, potential for it. I don't know if uh, people are actually ready for that in their, their lives yet, but uh, who knows? Who knows what uh, millennials want from their lives? Um, anyway, if we can just uh, finish the video there. Thank you. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, my panel today. I'm very happy uh, to be joined by Daniel Egloff from uh, Basel Tourism and uh, Nick Larson uh, from Time Looper. Uh, sadly, uh, Cy Brown from Skynes is unable to join us today, and we hope he's uh, better soon. Uh, and hope you weren't uh, coming to see him, but um, I'm sure um, we can share some information from Skynes uh, afterwards if you'd like that, so see me afterwards. Um, so, the reason I've asked uh, Daniel uh, to come and speak today is because you may have seen one of his uh, videos or one of his uh, department's uh, videos and that's uh, relating to Pokemon Go. I mean, the, the organization has uh, done some amazing things uh, with, with, uh, to, to sort of jump, jumping on the bandwagon. I don't like to call it that really, but uh, you know, t taking that interest in Pokemon Go and taking it to a new, new level and uh, getting interest in, in your destination. But uh, maybe you could come and uh, talk to about us about that, uh, Daniel. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mark, uh, for inviting me um, to this uh, panel. Yeah, my name is Daniel. I'm working for the tourist uh, office of Basel. So our main goal is to keep our guests in the city or to bring new guests uh, to our uh, city. And therefore, we do uh, provide some uh, information office at the desk, like you know, in, uh, in every city you, you will find. And we do marketing on... Uh, on channels, uh, all the channels you know. And we had the idea to do, um, to use the Pokemon hype and uh, to try to bring our city by this video clip uh, to a worldwide audience. That was the idea and uh, you know uh, better and as, I, as I do, you have to do a lot of these clips till one is really hitting through the ceiling. But this one uh, was one of these, so uh, perhaps we have a look at it. Uh, what was uh, the results of uh, Pokemon Go uh, turned by our uh, team? you just uh, saw the, the film which uh, went uh, around the world and um, but perhaps before I go to the details uh, I uh, let introduce Nick uh, and then we are ready for uh, the discussion thank you can we queue up the presentation
Can we have uh, Time Looper's uh, presentation on, please? <laughs> All right, well, we'll get started and they'll, uh, they'll catch up to us. Here we are. So my name is Nick Larson. Uh, I manage the European market for a company called Time Looper. So the market itself is huge in travel and tourism. That's no surprise, that's why we're all here today. The top 100 sites in the world see one billion people a year. So that's annual, it's evergreen. That market represents about $10, million, $10 billion in gated revenue. So that excludes ancillary spending like flights, hotels, that sort of thing. So it's a very attractive market. These are the most valuable pieces of real estate in the world. They bore witness to incredible moments in history, yet so often the experience at these different sites falls short of the former glory. So when you go there, they're either a partially deconstructed edifice, a field of grass, or, worth, or best case, over-commercialized. So what we do at Time Looper so we've created a virtual attraction platform that allows visitors to these different sites to relive the pivotal events or moments that shape them. So right now, I'm going to show you an example of content that we created for the Times Square Alliance in New York City. When people go to Times Square, they often don't realize it's the site of the infamous VJ Day Kiss in 1945 a moment that symbolized the euphoria at the end of World War II. So what we've done is recreated that moment for them using virtual reality. And can we cue to the demo, please? So hopefully you guys recognize this photograph. Square today. Now we take you back to 1945. No, maybe. Looks like we're having some AV issues in the back. Okay. Well, we'll we'll call it there. Hopefully, hopefully that gives you an idea of uh, of what we do. But the point is, we take you to a site that, you know, without any other visual cues, you'd never be able to realize that these this incredible moment happened there. Um, and so we bring it to life using your smartphone and the power of virtual reality. We are live at Tower Bridge starting December 1st. So when visitors arrive to Tower Bridge, they have the opportunity to purchase the Time Looper experience on top of their ticket price. They receive a cardboard headset, download the Time Looper app, and then experience three different moments throughout the exhibit. We, do, we recreate the construction of the bridge in the late 1800s, we do uh, the Great Fire of London from the vantage of the top of the bridge. And then we do, we recreate um, a bridge lift using the old basilisk powered steam engines in the engine room of the exhibit. We have three other pieces of content throughout the city of London. We do the Great Fire outside of St. Paul's Cathedral, medieval times outside of Tower Bridge, and the Blitz during World War II in Trafalgar Square. We also work in education and broadcast media. Uh, within the education sphere, we work with Google Expedition. The idea is that now students should not only be able to read and study the Great Fire in their textbook, but they should be able to read about it, study it, and then see what it was like to actually be there during the Great Fire of London. 
we did, uh, we made a partnership with CNN earlier this year, and we recreated three events to coincide with Tom Hanks' tribute to the 80s. So in the course of the television show, they cover the Challenger crash, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the death of John Lennon. The idea is that viewers experience and hear about these moments through the television series, and that we can show them what it's like to actually be there as the wall's falling or as the memorial erupts in, in New York City. We're live in London, New York, and Izmir at a UNESCO heritage site. Washington, D.C. with National Parks is coming early this year. Sydney, Beijing, we signed a contract with the Great Wall of China, and Seoul next year as well. So that's it for now. Hopefully that gives you uh, a brief idea of some of the applications of this technology. We find that in the tourism space, most people are focusing on allowing you to see what things are like and experience things on your couch before you actually arrive to places. But here, we think the power and the application of the technology is actually improving visitor experience. So allowing you again to relive these incredible moments at the different sites in which they occurred. That's all for now. Uh, thanks for that, Nick, and, uh, and I'm sure you can uh, show people that uh, afterwards if, uh, if they want to have a look at it. Absolutely. Uh, they always say not to work with children and animals, don't they? But uh, live technology demonstrations are up there as well. Yeah. It worked yesterday, so I can't, I can't hope for batting a yeah, thousand. It looks so amazing, though. Two. I mean, we saw it uh, a little there, I think, yeah, but yeah, uh, yeah. it's re really amazing. It's, it's a step towards that, uh, that utopia or dystopia that I showed uh, earlier on, and it shows a real sort of travel and tourism angle to that. Uh, I was interested about um, your choice of city there as well, Izmir, for the, for the third. What, mm -hmm. what's, uh, what's the reason behind that? Yeah, so um, outside of Izmir is Ephesus, which is a UNESCO heritage site. It was at one point the second largest city within the Roman Empire. Um, and today, if you go, it's almost completely deconstructed. There are few vestiges of the old city still remaining. So for us, it was an incredible use case for the technology because there's almost nothing there. So it's an opportunity to recreate the city from scratch. Um, and they do, they do something similar on site today with pictures and, um, and written narrative. But the technology has gotten good enough that, that you shouldn't just rely on on written text or um, an audio guide to tell you what a place should be w was like back at a point in time. You should be able to actually see it and, and relive it for yourself. And so you had a rollout of city, cities there. Um, how are you deciding on those uh, going forward? Is it some investment that you need from the cities, you know, from uh, visit, visit London, London and Partners, those, those sorts of people to get this mm -hmm. off the ground? Yeah, so, um, so a partnership, we've been working with the London and Partners here within the City of London. They're charged, they're the, the marketing arm of the mayor's office, and I'm sure some of you know, they're charged with promoting economic development and tourism within the City of London. So for us, there's a great synergy between our business models. We focus on providing economics on site, but then also controlling the flow of traffic within the sites themselves. So when viewers go to one site, they experience the content, and then we push them to other sites because you have to be there to actually experience the moments. Um, so a partnership like that is incredibly helpful. For us, the first two cities were London and New York, because London is the largest international tourism hub, and New York is the largest domestic. So it was a great use case in experimenting with both inbound and then local tourists. Great. Uh, just to invite you to ask questions as before using the WTM London app, I see uh, somebody's already started. Uh, you just click on the session name and you can ask those in your own name or anonymously as well if you're, if you're a bit scared of speaking up. So thank you for doing that. Uh, Daniel, I wanted to turn to you as well. I mean, you were, you were quick to get onto the idea of Pokemon Go there, weren't you? I mean, that's an incredible video and incredible to see that doing so well. I mean, it, do you think it's just a, a passing fad, you know, Pokemon Go, or is it something that uh, actually is going to be relevant for, for tourism organizations in the future? Yeah, I mean, the example we saw, it was just something quick and, uh, I mean, we did it in two weeks. It costs, uh, the, the whole film producing and everything was uh, below 10,000 euros and uh, it was just uh, a lucky punch. But it was more a kind of a marketing uh, effort we did. Um, what I heard this morning about VR or augmented reality and all this stuff. I mean, I love it. I'm sure it will be very important for uh, for our industry. But when I look at uh, Basel, my city where I work, Switzerland, Europe, um, 
I think I can speak for the most of them with a few expectations that uh, DMCs, hotels, museums, all these institutions doesn't, um, let's say, um, um, use or fully exploit the, the, the possibilities they could do. I mean, it's great to have these kind of films, but a lot of hotels, if it's not a chain, uh, they don't have video material, they don't have pictures, they don't look at their, uh, I mean, they, they work a little bit on their ratings. Um, and I say, do first your homework with these very simple things to fix first before you go next step and uh, you go to, to uh, VR or, 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 or AG. So I'm looking forward, but I, I think first we have to take the first step. I mean, yeah. I think the, the, the suppliers are not as fast in exploiting the possibilities as the technology is going forward. So I say first look at this, fix it, that, and then go on. Uh, Nick, I was going to ask you about that. I mean, you've got some great archive footage in there, but you can't rely on that entirely, can you? Because, um, you know, not as, as Daniel says, not, not every hotel has that sort of footage that they can use for, for doing sort of retro type of marketing. I mean, how, how do you get r around that? I mean, do you, do you do something beyond archive footage? Do you use CGI, for example, or, or virtual reality and modeling techniques to do this? Yes, all of the above. Um, so we use archival footage, photographs, video, uh, written text to, in the idea generation stage. Um, and then our chief creative officer uses that material to make sure that everything is historically accurate and relevant, right? Because these site operators and owners, they're the ones that know the stories better than anyone. So we don't try to recreate the wheel there. We utilize their resources and what they have to help us create content based off of that image. Um, so for example, in the video that you saw, um, those, that was involved, we, we filmed on site, 360 degree video, but the vast majority of the work was done in the production studio. So we recreate the historical backdrop with matte painting. So we recreate basically a, a, a new world and then film against a green screen and overlay that to create the experience. So most of it happens in the studio and in and a lot of post-production work. Yeah. Um, I'm always slightly worried about uh, sort of technologies like this in, in travel and tourism in that um, you know, it, it introduces a barrier between you and the experience. You know, so after all, you know, when, when we're traveling, we want to you know, f feel you know, the grass on a you know, beautiful meadow in, in, you know, or, or feel the, the sea breeze on our face. But um, you know, when you're using virtual reality or augmented reality, you, you've got to have a device in front of you, haven't you? I mean, mm -hmm. do you think that spoils the experience? Um, you know, for, for having that barrier in between you? I, I don't know if you, you have thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I don't. Um, so we cater all of our experiences to complement existing narratives that are told on site, right? So it's, it's really, we're not, invent, we're not reinventing the, re, the wheel. What we do is already, a, the sites already attempt to do through, again, written text or pictures or short videos. Um, we just do it in a better way and tell those stories with virtual reality. But for example, at, at Tower Bridge, those three videos that we've created for the experience, each of those is between 90 seconds and two minutes. So it's a flashback at different points through the exhibit. It's not, um, and it, it's, a, it's a very small part of the exhibit. It's powerful, but it's very small. If someone goes and spends an hour going through the museum and in the, the, the engine room and the gift shop, then you know, you're talking about a, a four to six minute experience that's complementing that. Okay. Um, do, do you have any thoughts on that? You know, the barrier that uh, these devices are having, particularly people coming yeah. to, to Basel to uh, play Pokemon Go after seeing your video, for example. No, but I, I agree, and I think uh, the technique will be uh, going on, and uh, in some years uh, everything will be in my glasses. So I don't think that this barrier uh, will still exist in, in, in some years. Um, but the question is more, do I want all this information? Uh, I loved your film, you showed at the beginning of the session. Um, I'm sometimes too much. I don't want to know all these things, perhaps. So I, I think you have to find a good balance between uh, that your client will find the useful information, uh, like some good pictures, uh, some, some good uh, recommendations very quickly, and then when he want to go deeper and deeper, uh, why not? Um, but sometimes can also be too much. Uh, so 
I think technique will handle it. We will handle the technique, but the question will, will be how much we will use it. So um, Pokemon Go, I can see there's a question about um, more on Pokemon Go in, in Basel. You know, what, what, what next? How do, you, how do you capitalize on that interest in, in Basel? Do you do produce more Pokemon Go related content or work with the Niantic, the, uh, the company behind that to, to, to try and uh, drive you know, more yeah. visitors to the city? No, I mean, to be honest, it was a lucky punch. I mean, yeah. you can't planify such a success uh, that the video went around the globe. So it's difficult to make your strategy on, on a lucky punch. So as I said before, first do your homework, uh, your solid work, and then when you have some spare money, uh, try, uh, try something out. Uh, but you never can, can be sure that it will be shared by the community. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's high risk. So. Yeah. I think it's an interesting um, concept, this idea of sort of, uh, you know, real time um, engagement as well, sort of seeing what's happening, you know, um, you know, in the world, you know, hijacking the news and the interest of what's, what's going on. And I think we heard about that uh, in our previous session with Visit Philadelphia, how they were sort of, you know, engaging with people when they're in there. And this is a sort of similar idea, isn't it? You know, seeing what's popular and then, you know, bending it to your needs. I yeah, think. yeah, absolutely. Mm. Especially for the marketing part that, uh, that you, you can do this during these two, three months. You have to be one of the first and then it's gone. I mean, you don't come again now with Pokemon. It's already gone. So, but I mean, your application is, is great for DMCs too. When you want to explain a museum, you see a, a dinosaurier uh, it just uh, being in front of you and to make him uh, uh, moving again and uh, to, to explain uh, a city, what, what was the house before and all this stuff. I mean, yeah. I, I see that as a big, big sort of area where this, this may be of interest, and I'm sure you, you've had this, uh, Nick, as well, from uh, uh, museums particularly, because they're, they're always sort of trying to push the boundaries of the, the experience when people come to them, you know, and that's, that's been manifested by, you know, all of these uh, push buttons and uh, video techniques. I mean, do you, do you find that it's museums uh, that, that are particularly interested in this rather than destinations more broadly? Yeah, museums are, are, are interested um, because they, they have artifacts uh, that you can bring to life and because it's a great environment, right? So you, you've already selected for people that are coming there with um, the aspiration of getting closer to history, um, but also sites where, um, open sites, sites where, where nothing exists today. I think that's some of the even more powerful applications. Um, you know, there's, there's more left to the imagination there so there's more that AR and VR can do to bridge you closer to those moments or those events. And we have a couple of questions from the audience regarding uh, cost for you uh, there, Nick, as well. You know, how much does this all cost? And could you scale it down from something like Times Square to um, you know, an English village where they had some uh, footage of a, of a church, for example? I mean, is mm -hmm. that going to be feasible for a, for a small um, operation to be able to afford that sort of technology? Yes, absolutely. So we. Um, we don't make money off of producing content. Uh, we're not a production house. We use our production capabilities sort of as a means to the end. Um, so we produce content at cost, cheaper than anyone else in the world. We pr our chief creative officer sits in Istanbul and utilizes a production network in Turkey and outside of uh, Turkey and Eastern Europe. So for example, that one video that you saw in Times Square, I'm not going to tell you how much it costs, but I think it would shock you. Um, so in a the good answer way. is in a good way. In a good way. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, in a, in a, in a good way. Um, so we, we focus on the partnership that happens after we've created the content. So marketing it on site, activating points of sale for these different museums or government entities, um, and that's how that's how we make money. So the content is incre incredibly inexpensive to to produce. Right. Okay. Um, so now we've got a question about local and authentic experiences, and I think that's uh, an interesting point. That's related to cost obviously as well, but uh, do you think uh, there's, there's scope to use this sort of technology in um, you know, linking it with uh, local authentic Swiss uh, experiences, for example? Yeah, I talked about homework before, and um, when I see our guests moving in the city, they're all looking for free Wi-Fi. Where is free Wi-Fi here? Because it's uh, expensive still. And uh, I ask myself, why are we not, we are, we are talking so much in the future, but till the basics like like giving all the guests free internet access in the city, it's, it's not in every city the case. 
So I say there we have to invest uh, uh, first, and then I'm sure uh, if a museum or an authority starts producing uh, something, uh, another one sees uh, and and and, th and says we, we don't we have this we don't have it and we we need it too. So I think that will be step by step like. Ten years before the internet, uh, hotels started to have a photo, then they have a film, and then they have uh, augmented reality or virtual, virtual reality, and then, um, so I think, don't panic, <laughs> take your steps, but do, do it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nick, do you think, um, you know, we've, we've talked about augmented reality, but for virtual reality as well, I mean, are they um, inextricably linked, those two things? I mean, we've seen a huge amount of investment uh, from people like uh, Facebook in, in uh, virtual reality. Uh, do you see that as a, a good channel for you going down that route? I do, yeah. So I think they do two very different things. And the, the video that I showed was more a, a virtual reality experience than an augmented reality experience. But it was augmented reality in the sense that when you're on site, the video is directionally accurate, so it knows which way you're looking. So, for example, in Times Square, there are some young buildings in front of you, billboard to your right. The orientation is accurate, so it becomes almost augmented reality in that sense. But uh, to answer your question, no, I don't think they're inextricably linked. I think they do two different things. Um, you know, it's like it's like a hammer and a wrench almost. Um, they're they're both new frontier technologies, but they provide the user with different experiences. So. Um, in the Times Square video, you're transported to a different point in time, right? So we've recreated everything. If you were at uh, the Smithsonian History Museum and you're looking at um, a, a mammoth skeleton or something, and we brought that to life, that, that that's also incredibly insightful and interesting, but they're just different, right? So it's not recreating a world or traveling back in time. It's um, showing you the way that a, an animal behaved or, or acted at a certain point in time. So I think they're, they're two very different use cases. Um, and just uh, sort of finally from me, I mean, do, do you think that we're very far away from that, uh, that film we showed at, at, the, at the front? I mean, is the technology that close to delivering that sort of experience? Do we, do we have that all available to it it's at the moment? It just needs putting together? Uh, I don't know. The, the, I find that it always takes longer for these sort of things to materialize than people think. I mean, we've been talking about augmented reality and virtual reality now for 10 years, um, and, and we're still not there. So I don't think... I don't think it's, you know, this isn't a two or three year thing. Um, the, the hurdle that we need to overcome is we need to allow this technology or make this technology more ubiquitous in the market. So one of the problems that we still have is when tourists show up at Tower Bridge in London, they still aren't familiar with the technology. So then we have to educate them. What is virtual reality? And then, you know, how can this supplement and complement the experience that you can have at this location? Um, so from what we're seeing in the market, that, that gap is still pretty big. Um, and taking it a step further where you know, people are using it in their day-to-day -day lives is, I think, probably three plus years away. Mm, great. Uh, so that was all the time we had, unfortunately. Um, can people put their hands up if they think they can see a use for augmented reality uh, in their own uh, destinations and businesses? There's a few, that's good. Hope you get inspired by this. Um, thank you, uh, Nick. Thank you, Daniel, for sharing your um, experiences with this. I'm sure you'll stick around for, for a couple of minutes to answer any questions, that specific sure. ones that the audience have. Uh, but I just wanted to, to ask the audience to show their appreciation for our speakers today. Thank you.